Hello, my name is Lewis Frazier, and I'm President and CEO of Wintelect. Wintelect is a professional services firm that provides software developers with custom application development, training, and conferences to support the Win32 and .NET platforms for Microsoft. We created custom application development originally to provide architectural overview on the front end of projects or our debugging services on the back end. However, now we are able to write entire software applications and deliver those projects to our customers at the end of the engagement. For training, who trains Microsoft developers? Well, we do. For almost 10 years, we provide training classes for Microsoft developers that are hired, whether they be in Redmond, Washington, or Beijing, China. Many of our courses are actually prerequisites once those developers are hired on campus. Finally, we created DevScovery conferences seven years ago to provide small regional conferences and a way for developers to reach our know-how experts. This session is titled Azure Lessons from the Field. Um, we want to take a quick moment to thank our sponsors, without which we would have no conference. So both, both of these guys are funding different aspects of the conference. Hey, thanks. Um, the quick, less, quick overview of what we're going to talk about. If you came to the earlier session, this one is going to be a little higher level, a little more introductory in some aspects of cloud computing, specifically the Azure platform. The one this morning, I assumed a certain level of understanding of the cloud. Here, I'm still going to assume some, but we'll go into certain areas a little bit deeper. The, um, we're talking about, uh, how many people know what ORNL is and who we are? And, the last time I gave this presentation, nobody did, so I spent a little more time there because they looked at me like, who are you and why should you care? So we'll talk a little bit about that, but not too much. Um, the Azure in five minutes is a joke. Um, it'll be a little longer than that. So <laughs> just, just to give you a warning. Then we'll talk about sort of why we, to a degree, this is a report of a project that we've been working on and actually still in process for. And using that as idea fodder, or, conversation fire for discussing things we've learned about Azure, things that may be of interest to you, may help you with your application development and so forth. So we'll sort of bring you up to speed on the project, where we are, how we've been using it, and how that contrasts to some other models that people will be using the cloud for. And then we'll talk about some apps and things that, and some lessons we're learning and things to look at. So DOE, or ORNL is one of DOE's largest science labs. We've got a significant budget, money that runs through there every year. We have an order of oh, seven to eight, 10,000 people at any given point in time. A lot of those are fluctuating researchers and students that come through at various points of the year. Um, as, a, as a nerd or a geek, it's a very cool place to work. Lots of big words, lots of big tech, interesting things going on. Um, here's the marketing slide of all the cool things that people do. The people in the, in the building I work at are very proud of this slide. Um, I work with most. In, I work in computer science research group, and there's a lot of which is part of computer science and mathematics, which is part of CCSD, which is computers, com, computing and computational sciences and engineering. The this is important because it gives some scale to some of the other things we're going to talk about. The, the, one of the emphases for the projects we have is when you acquiesce to the fact that there are problems that require this level of hardware to solve the computation space, there are other problems that don't require this type of hardware but are still valid scientific work. Right? So we have a lot of people who, who are really nerdy and really focused on this, which is good and, and certainly valid, but not every problem expresses itself well over 225,000 cores and specialized networks and things like that. So there, there, while there certainly is a role for this, there are also is a role for more simplistic approaches to solving certain scientific problems. And that's part of what the project I'm working on right now is, is dealing with. Where, where does that intersection section hit? It is a pretty impressive machine though. There's lots of, those are the big numbers. Um, 
and there's actually, we're in the process of putting our third Petascale server for this summer, so we're, there's lots of computation power. So this is, so the question is, if you've got hardware like that, why do you care about cloud computing? Why do you care about the 10 cent per hour you know, in Amazon if you've got 225,000 of them sitting downstairs? And the, this slide sort of aims to discuss that. We, we have a, a, a large range of researchers working on a large range of projects, not only at our lab, but also other labs across the country. And some of those are data parallelized, some of them are tightly coupled problems, and that overly, overly broad distinguishing factor has sort of a broad implications to what platforms that problem will be well suited for or not. So a lot of our climate simulations need Climate simulations, um, some of the computational fluid dynamics codes, some of the molecular dynamics codes really need very specialized type integrated networks like you can see in Jaguar and Kraken or if you've heard about InfiniBand or things like that. We, they need that type of code the way they're currently architected. Um, other codes like um, BLAST, which is a common code used in genomics for doing sequence alignments and different genes and so forth. While you can, and people have figured out how to express those in parallel fashions over, over hardware like Jaguar, they don't, it's not necessarily a natural fit, or you, nor are you really exercising the machine to the degree it should, right? or you could. It's sort of using it because we have it, not because we need it. So if you have a hammer, it looks like a nail problem. And if you step back from the Jaguar and the Krakens of the world, and you look at sort of the mid-range what we would consider mid-range computing, which is between, say, 256 and 1,000 cores being used to express a problem across the DOE space, there's sort of a dearth of, of, of clusters that are available to serve that. They have a number of, they get heavily overloaded, you get your codes may wait in the queue for a while, and things like that. So we're looking at, can cloud computing fill a gap, or fill a burst gap there to solve some of the problems, to solve some of the problems? But that's sort of our main, our, main, our main goal. The other thing is to look at, um, while, we're, while I you know, mentioned a minute ago, I, gave, I mentioned that certain codes sort of naturally express themselves on devices like Jaguar, there are also problems that come along with that. When you have a computer that's, that's behaving as one massive unit with 225,000 cores and terabytes or petabytes of RAM, if any single part of that fails, you can actually take down the entire system. So there's a certain fragility that you introduce the larger you grow. And that it has, it can have massive effects on the ability to run longer and longer processes. So there is there is a school of thought, while we certainly have people who are focusing on solving those problems when they exist, there's also a school of thought that says, maybe we need to consider s s suspending or altering the way we're building it, rather than continuing to build bigger, we build more smaller units that are intelligently coupled. And so we sort of have parallel approaches and research areas going on. Especially, it's because particularly interesting when you get into the, the multi-core, many-core scenarios where you have a, an individual node that may have 48 cores in it, you can do localized type coupling, that nodes, node localized type coupling that is then segmented from other machines. Okay, and that's what why. Um, types of clouds. There's, I've got two slides here that sort of talk about the general, the general approaches. This morning we talked about IAS and PAS briefly. We focused specifically on IAS, which is infrastructure as a service. We define that as basically being um, virtual servers on demand. I go someplace and say, I need a virtual private server. I need 10 of them, or I need 50 of them, or 1,000, or one. That's what I'm getting. And this slide sort of helps you, get, helps you understand you know, if you look at sort of the whole suite of things that we're doing, your management responsibilities across the different types. And this is really important. Um, some of the questions that came out at the end of the, the last talk were, well, what if I need X, or what if I need to control the load balancer, or what if I want to update DLLs on one of my web heads and test it before rolling it out to the others? And there were, many of them were focused on specific levels of control. And the key is, is as we're thinking about which, how to use the cloud and what types of cloud apply to the problems I'm trying to solve, you have to make certain trade-offs in your mind. What matters to you? 
Where do you want to apply your focus? As you move up the chain, you're sort of giving up some control in, in exchange for some magic. You're getting some extra features, and things that you don't have to worry about, but in, in saying you don't have to worry about them, you're, you're accepting the way that someone else is doing them, right? So I can, if I care about all of these things, I can do them all on my deck. I can control every single little bit by flip everything. But I'm also responsible for every little bit by flipping everything. I have to, I have to be the one that responds to the page that calls at 3 a.m. for the critical systems deck, right? There's, I have this extra level of responsibility. As I move up the chain, you know, the less I have to worry about, the less I get to control. So Microsoft and, and Windows Azure, as we're going to talk about today, we're going to put specifically in this right-hand side, the platform as a service model. Now, as I mentioned this morning, Microsoft is blending this way, and Amazon is blending this way. And if you give it six, nine, 12 months, the commerce, the Differences between the two organizations will not be nearly as clear, at least some personal predictive moment. Um, there, Microsoft has already hinted that in the future they will allow RDP access into your boxes, which would be essentially um, an IAS offering. Amazon has already offered things like Elastic, you know, Elastic MapReduce, which is more or less a platform as a service offering. So they're, they're sort of stretching in either direction because they both view the other as similar to this red. And, also as an opportunity for business. This is another picture of the same thing, sort of another way to convey the same model. Right? So we're talking today specifically about the subway platform. If you fit in their train, they'll take you where you want to go. Right? If you want to go someplace else, you're on your own. So these are sort of the building blocks of the Windows Azure platform. So, we start sort of at the bottom, you have your different storage services. Computer is Windows Azure, SQL Azure, Azure Service Bus, which I think there was a session on that already, or there's another one coming. Uh, security layers, frameworks, applications. Today's talk, we're going to focus on these two bottom sections. We're not going to, I want to acknowledge the fact that these others exist and they add a lot of additional richness to the platform, but we're going to focus our talk on the lower two sections. Why do you use the, the um, app fabric, the server, the Windows server app fabric? I, I thought that Azure has its own app fabric and it's, it's different from the... It is. It's a mistake and a slide I stole from somebody, to be very brutally honest. Yes, it should be Windows Azure app fabric. When I first put the slide in, they had not announced that product. But certainly they build plans towards it, so probably they be unified. There's, there's a lot of assumptions <coughs> that the two will merge, and that there will be some... Depending on who you talk to, the Windows Server app fabric is we're a way of building a private cloud, which is true and not all at the same time. So there, there's, sort of, there's a, a somewhat of a disconnect between the marketing folks and the technical folks. And, over the next months or years, that will sort of smooth out and you'll have some, some continuity there. The compute platform. Uh, these numbers are probably slightly different if pretty close to accurate. Uh, this first bullet point here is pretty important. Um, it's not just .NET. You can run any code that can be bundled and deployed. So they've deployed runtimes for you can run your native code, you can run basically anything that will run full trust on a Windows box, you can run there. So it doesn't have to be .NET code, it doesn't have to be NFC, you can run Ruby, Python, and other codes as well. Um, <clears throat> on the web platform, they've extended it quite a bit, so they've got some of the other runtimes that you see listed there. But essentially, it's, I'm getting a, when, when, you, when you spin up an instance of a role, you're getting a dedicated virtual, dedicated virtual private machine. So it's it's virtualized, but it's only you're the only one running it. Now that doesn't mean you have full access to it, it's just a box in which you can run the code, your code, the way that they tell you you should run the code. If that makes sense. Again, it's platform, so we're moving up the chain, we're giving away for some stuff that we've got, we're getting magic for it. They handle all of this 
all of the upgrades, all of the patching, all of the fault tolerance, all of the health monitoring, all of that stuff you get for free with Windows. Whereas we talked this morning about, about Amazon, you can do all of that, but that's the onus for that is on you. Diagnostics is something, if you've played with Azure early on, this is something you'll, you'll be very happy to see. They didn't have this when they first released, they've added it since, and it's made a world of difference. It, it, when they first rolled out, you didn't have a good way to capture logs, you didn't have a good way to capture perf data of your boxes. It was very black box-ish. You would run your code and hope things worked, and it was sort of up to you to figure out if they didn't, why not. They've done a really good job, they've got a great diagnostics and APIs, and the docs are really good as far as helping you sort of consume that and add that into your application. The storage, there's there's a number of different levels of storage. We're going to focus on or talk about three today: queues, blobs, and and table storage. There's also um, they've got content distribution network. They've got what this, what's called X Drive. X Drive is essentially a VHD that's stored in the cloud that you can then mount to one of your instances. The intent behind it is to make it easier for you to migrate apps that are sort of used to talking to local storage because you can, you can basically provide a drive local to your code that would operate much like, say, a D drive or an E drive on your machine. <clears throat> so table storage. Table storage, this, this is one of the concepts that for traditional Microsoft developers seems to be a little harder for people to grok because we've been so well taught that relational databases are the way to go, we want constraints, we want, we want relation, you know, <clears throat> consistency, we have to have asset, you know, everything has to pass the asset test every time. That's not what this is. They have SQL Azure will give you that. This is, uh, think of it as an Excel sheet in the sky, right? It's just, you can create as many columns as you want, you can name them whatever you want, not every row has to have a value in every column, and every row could have different collections of columns. It's designed to be horizontally scalable, massively scalable to millions and billions of rows. And as we'll look at later, I've put three and a half billion entries in it. And it, so it does scale to that level at least. It's not terribly fast for inserts, but it is, it does scale pretty well. It is schemaless, so you have to sort of define your objects as you're going in and out, and sort of provide your own structure for it. Uh, block blob and page blob. Page blob is the X drive feature that I was talking about a few minutes ago, essentially. Um, block blob is I want to put a file someplace. That's block or the, the block blob mirrors almost identically to Amazon's S3 product. So if you just want to store files in the cloud, if you want to you know, essentially that, that's what it is. Um, they, there are some differences, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But in general, that's all it is. It's just a bucket for you to drop files in. You get charged per gigabyte month. So every every full month that I have a gigabyte there, I get charged something like 10 or 15 cents. And then they prorate it across the month based on your actual usage. But very, very effective storage. Everything here is triply replicated, which there's a couple things should be going off in your mind. A, that's a pretty good redundancy. B, that probably means slow inserts, because every time I insert, it has to be copied three times, which both of those things would be good things to be firing in your mind. Um, <clears throat> Azure Q, this is MSMQ in the cloud. It's basically Q based storage or Q based communication for distributed applications. So if you have multiple aspects to your application that you want to be able to scale horizontally, insert queues between your components so you can have failures and survive failures, that's the way to go. Um, if you were here this morning, this, this maps very almost identically to. Simple queue service from Amazon. It's almost exactly the same. A um, couple of method operations. They are persistent, or they're um, what's the word? They are they're, they, they're fault tolerant. So it's a two-phase commit to your queue operation. So you submit. If I pop something off the queue, it doesn't actually it doesn't actually go away. It's just hidden from any other clients until I go back and say yes, I'm done. Or if I fail to come back and say yes, I'm done with it. For a timeout period, it shows back up and someone else can pick it up. So there's a two phase operation. Uh, drive, this, is, this maps to the, the page blob as we were talking about. And CDN, this was 
CDN is is sort of an add-on part portion to the to the blob storage. This is this is interesting for a number of reasons, particularly for large customers, obviously, but it's also I think for the the small customers, this is really interesting. So one of the comments we sort of have in these talks is who the cloud is really targeting. And it's not like if you're I mentioned this morning, if you're running on if you're running on GoDaddy or one and one right now and you're happy, Azure's not for you. It's targeted a different audience, with the exception of this feature. So this is this is one of those features that's priced just right. So if you need CDN that you're a small shop and can't really afford, you know, the notion of even talking to some of the big boys scares you, which probably will. This is a great way to get in that space. You can, for pennies a month, you can get into the space and sort of start experimenting with content delivery. Um, Azure has theirs, um, Amazon has theirs, it's as simple as uploading a file and basically right clicking and say enable for CDN and then it's just a magic happens. You get this magic URL that you use and it gets distributed in cache for files. Very interesting. So you, you, Go ahead. You're you, storing a file with just a URL as a file name? Yes, so every, everything, so I, I, good question. Everything that goes into Bob storage is URL accessible. So everything you put up there has its own URL. So once you put it there, yeah, it, it's a it's accessible based on the ACLs you set. So you can make it public read, you can make it private and all that stuff. But if you're using CDN, generally you would make it public read, and then if you mark that container for for CDN usage, they'll give you an alternate access URL to use at the beginning of it. And depending on how you're using CDN, or if you use that CDN. Up, URL on your website, if someone is, say, in Hong Kong and they, hit, they try to download your big file, it will actually look at, through the, some magic of DNS routing, it will look at local data centers there in Hong Kong first to pull the file from. If it exists, it will retrieve it from there. Otherwise, it will go to the source, pull it down to the local cache in there, and then return it to the client. So it, it's, not, it's not like Akamai, where it's a push CDN. It's a, it's, it's a pull and cache-based CDN. But it's still pretty interesting if you're doing sort of burst level distribution of large data. Any questions? But, uh, can they really distribute it worldwide? I mean, uh, I have to specify a um, you know, data center location. No. So, so, so you, what you do is when you create a when you create a what they call a container within Azure, which is sort of your root namespace for all of your files for blob, you specify a data center where that's going to be there. Give you a bunch of options. You can say, like U.S. North Central, U.S. South Central, Europe. They've got one in Asia. So you pick one where it lives. So all of the files in there live in that data center natively. What happens then is if I enable that container for CDN, it will. And I use the alternate. I use the CDN URL. Every request will, will, will try to first go to the, to the data center closest to where the browser or the client is. And if it doesn't find it there, like I said, it will go to the home one, pull it, cache it locally, and then return it. So it's the cache-based approach. This slide, I, I, I sort of, I, I like to put it in like to sort of let you chew on it. And I, don't, I don't want to read all the points, but these are these are very important if you're looking at the cloud and you're looking to design apps for the cloud. It is while while when we're talking this morning, we're talking about Amazon. You can take sort of your standard app and take your Almost any regular Windows app or web app, you, <coughs> DNN, like this morning we, took, we looked at a sample. I just pulled something down off the web platform installer, boom, boom, and it was there and it was working. While you can do that, you're, you cannot do that as well in Azure, and you're going to be throwing away some of, your, some of the benefits of the cloud. You have to think about who the cloud is designed for. You know, why did Microsoft build this? Why did Amazon build it? Who, what customers were they targeting? What were the problem profiles they were targeting? They're targeting large-scale web applications that need to scale horizontally, and particularly ones that have in, have a burst-level approach. Right? So they'll have traffic that will run at some sort of steady state, and will have levels of burst traffic. That's really their prime customer. So you need to design, if you want to really benefit from all of the features you have, you, or the platform, you want to design your app to leverage those features. Um, <coughs> The anything specific I want to call out there. Uh, 
idempotent. Anybody know what idempotent is? It's my favorite word that I can never really say quite properly. So idempotent means um, I can do the same operation multiple times and I get the same exact result. So this is really important if you have queue-based operations. We were talking earlier. If I have a queue that, if I have a worker role that's processing my jobs off my queue, it gets halfway through and blows up. It's going to go away. My Azure's going to spin up a new node. It will pull that up off the thing. And it's going to start back over at the beginning. So depending on how granular I did or didn't make my my unit of work, I need to be able to repeat the beginning part without messing up my overall results. So you need to design your blocks to be idempotent so they can be run multiple times with the same result. A good way to think about this, um, anybody classify themselves as a Rastafarian? Um, so HTTP, the you know, guys who, who sort of preach and espouse the REST protocols for using data access in the web. Some very interesting points, and there's, there's some, a lot of goodness there. One of the things they would sort of preach against or talk against is um, using misusing pro, misusing uh, HTTP verbs like a get. So if you have a parameterized get, that uh, a lot of websites can parameterize gets incorrectly and actually they actually do things, they perform actions rather than simply retrieving the data. And you can't constantly call that get without changing the changing the event. So say you're using it in a web application that's using the query string based gets rather than doing HTTP posts like you should be. That's, that results in a non idempotent environment. And back earlier in the history of the web, sites like Google and so forth, they would crawl that and they'd issue, they'd basically do every get they could on a page and they'd repeat those things that caused havoc in many applications that didn't support idempotency. So, but in your queue based jobs, you have, that's a big thing to keep in mind. Application patterns. There are a number of application patterns. Looking at the cloud, these are sort of some of the big block pieces, and what I've highlighted are the ones that we used in our application, sort of the ones we're going to be talking about. But I want to put them here in context so you see sort of, sort of the other things that are available and where they fit. So we focus on an enterprise application that submits things directly to a queue, to queues that are then controlled worker roles that interact with the three different storage mechanisms. So the application goals, so we wanted to simulate the, pro the post-processing of scientific data. So if you came in early, you saw a little app on the screen, we'll pop into it here in just a minute. That is a visualization app that is, is showing data that came out of the AR4 climate data set run. That's basically, it's a terascale data set, somewhere in the order of 35 terabytes with ones and zeros, that simulated a number of different things across a di number of different climate models and variables. It was used in conjunction with Al Gore to win the Nobel Peace Prize a few years ago. Whether you think that's good or bad, it's sort of irrelevant, but that's, that's where this data came from. As that said, it was generated on the Jaguar supercomputer in ONL. But what we get at the end of that is this net CDF file. And unless you're a climate a climatologist or a domain scientist, you don't know what a net CDF file is. It's just, a, just a, a, an odd file. What it is, is it's a particular, it's a, it's a very highly compressed binary format that does multi, or n-dimensional arrays. You can, you can have six-dimensional arrays and, and represent them. And it's all self-describing, which is great for passing around large pieces of data, but hard to consume on the web. It's hard to open it up and say, hey, I want to know what the temperature is at this point. At the intersection of this Latin long and this time series. So we wanted to focus on how can we take that data and map what we thought was a very valid scenario for the cloud, which is post-processing data, and sort of run that. So we, we sort of came up with, we talked to some of the researchers and we came up with a, a similar process to what they do sometimes, and model that out in the cloud. As I was mentioning earlier, the data that you'll see has been more or less specifically obfuscated, so we focused on the data, not the, or we focused on the problem we were trying to guess, not individual temperature values and things like that. Uh, so as mentioning, we start sort of with a source file of the NetCDF. Um, we then flatten that, so we basically take it and put it in a format that we can sort of process. 
In our case, we put it in CSV files. We then generate a heat map, which is just a, a bitmap image with different levels of gray based on the intensity of, or relative values. We colorize that. Combine that with a heat map. Combine that image with sort of a static base map. And then we generate a video and animation. Then finally, we wanted to take the data and make it accessible in more interesting formats. So we basically load it up into Azure tables and then expose it as a as a <coughs> ODATA web service. Sorry, the word is So as an ODATA web service, we have Azure tables and models. So this is, I started off as a, what I would consider general.net dev, and wasn't working a lot in scientific research. So when I sort of got into space, the sheer size of data sort of, sort of amazed me. Um, to put it in context, if we took a single image, so if you look at one, shot, one sheet of the image that was displayed earlier, it's roughly 40 kb. Um, if we showed a, one of those every 10 seconds, to, to show you, you the entire set, it would take you 200 years to see, just to view every one of those, much less analyze it individually. We're talking about lots of numbers and lots of data. We took a subset of that. You can see sort of the numbers here, what percentage of it we took, sort of sliced it down and said we want, we're going to focus on a sort of a consumable beat portion of it. <clears throat> Some lessons, let's pop up for a second and look at the apps and we know what we're talking about. This is what we came up with. This is a um, Silverlight application running in on Chrome right now. The main view is a single map point, so this is for the, the time scale. This particular experiment, the surface air temperature at that time scale, those are all the data points. So this represents basically 40K worth of source data, so numbers. And each of those data points is a lat long and a temperature value. So it's not, not anything you can imagine. We colorize it, put it on here, give a visualization tool so you can mouse around and see the value of the Point. Um, nothing special. You can crawl through it and see how great I am. I'm not going to break. I'm not going to trust the network. But <clears throat> you can crawl through it, basically browse through the different steps of experience, the different experiments, see different values and things like that. And then if you pop here, you see the raw data that actually makes up that image. It was used to generate the image. This animation is that shows up, it was running at the beginning, is it just a, a stitching together of all of the images for that particular experiment, for that time frame, nothing special. So that's what, this is sort of where we're ending up with. Um, some obvious statements. Um, data gets large as you flatten it. We took our, our 92 megs of text, or 92 megs of Net CDF file. When we flattened, all we did is we took that and flattened it to CSV, and it jumped to almost a gig, because it gives you an idea of how tightly it was compressed versus the different storage formats. Um, another thing we can't, we a semi obvious statement is that within the Azure data center, the network transfer is very, very fast. It's particularly as compared to the, to the public internet. So if you're moving large amounts of data. You want to move it into Azure in as compressed a format as you can and then handle your flattening and your expanding there because you're going to, you're, otherwise you're going to take that penalty. If you do all that flattening locally or that expanding your data locally, you're going to take a big penalty hit. Azure tables, um, the inserts and deletes we found were very slow. And as I mentioned this morning, a, a non-qualitative but um, experiential comment would be that they're significantly slower than that. Than the Amazon SDB. Amazon SDB inserts seem much faster in, in our experience with it. Um, but the inserts were very slow, but they, they remained linear. So as we were doing, we timed, obviously, we were timing all, all of our operations. And even as we got up in well over a billion entries, the time were statistically the same as, you know, so entry 1 billion 1 was, took the same amount of time to, to add as entry 1 did. So it scales horizontally very, very nicely. It's still not overly fast. Yes? 
you have a single server database to party on trace, why would you use that after that? Um, the SQL Server database will not ever allow you to scale as, as highly as an Azure Tables will do. That, that's the whole reason. That, so if you look at why at the reasoning sort of behind Amazon and Microsoft's approach for offering both, they're, they're, they solve different problems. If you're, if you're doing a, a smaller web application, a, a, web app, a relational database is going to scale just fine. If you look at some massively horizontal, massive horizontal scaling on your web on your web apps, and you do reads and lookups, you're never going to get the performance you need out of a relational database. Well, I it's a different web apps technology, so I have it's, different performance it's, it's, Yes, it's not a database technology. It's I mean, it's a data storage technology, but it's, it's specifically not an RDS. It's not RDS. Yes. 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 It's not relational. It's not schema based. It just again. It's, Think of it almost as, a, as a, an extensible CSV in the cloud or Excel spreadsheet in the cloud and it's optimized for reads. Yes? So, so if you have a first application you need that's working with a SQL Server database, uh, Azure SQL Server, uh, where is the point of no return? So, so SQL Azure is going to behave very similarly to a SQL Server you house internally, right? It's, it's, SQL Azure is really no different. I mean, it, there are differences, but more or less it's going gonna, it's gonna to have the same general performance characteristics. So the same way you would hit, even, even with the, if you have many web heads in your, if you're doing this all private, if you have many web heads hitting as SQL clusters, I think at some point, you can keep adding web heads, but your database is going to be your bottleneck. You will experience the same thing with SQL Azure. Now they they they're doing some magic to try to make that to make it easier to not hit that. But the, the fact that you will hit at some point is evidenced by the fact that they provide the other storage format. The, the other thing that comes into play there is just the sheer storage size that you're allowed. Yes. Right now, SQL Azure has two frames and they just announced last week that they upped one, but even then the biggest SQL Azure database that they will let you have right now is 50 gigabytes. Right. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so they have, they have 10, it was, it was one, in ten, 10, one in 10, it's one in 10, and then now they've... It used to be one to five and up to 10, or, or one and 10, and now it's two and 50. Yeah. So there, there are limitations, and, and it all has to do with how they, how the underlying application does internal storage and does its maintain its relations. There's sort of an interesting conversation to be once you sort of wrap your mind or try to wrap your mind around that a little bit, go sit on in on some of the NoSQL talks or sort of that those guys are sort of solving it, solving the problem in a different way. It's the same sort of mentality for sort of that large horizontal scale. And a lot of people are using SQL or using tables for 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 sort of static lookup tables or reads. So they'll publish their, they may have an RDB DMS that sort of backends it, but then will publish to the horizontal table so it can be then read widely by, by clients at scale. So if you're revving up for a first demand situation uh, and getting the increased capacity on your uh, application, uh, you can't rev up your your Azure SQL uh, not beyond the 50 gig limit. Beyond that, right. but you can rev it up. Uh, that's, in, that's in terms of the total limit. But in terms of access, are you getting any increased access? Are you getting more more demand from your applications? Uh, I don't believe so. So maybe maybe a scenario that might be a little more consumable. Say I'm running an e-commerce store, okay. okay, and maybe maybe I've got a a SQL database server that's powering that. If I'm looking to scale horizontally, I'm looking for this massive scale, I might take my my, my catalog data, so all of my store shopping products, sales, features, all of that stuff, publish that to Azure Tables. So when people are browsing and clicking, they're looking at all of this uh, more or less static data 
they're doing that against that tables when they actually check out and they still write that against my SQL database where I care a little bit more about consistency. And I may put that catalog on some refresh schedule like daily or something like that. Make sense? Yeah, sure does. So I mean, is, good. I was saying, isn't a lot of volume sort of splitting it uh, between your transactions and data warehouse type thing? I mean, it is. This, type of, this is almost like data warehouse type thing. It's you're flattening it out, putting it out there so it's fast retrieval type thing. Yes, it's very similar. Um, yeah, so the last point here, not well suited for large large or frequently changing data because the inserts and the deletes take a long time. Reads are fast, inserts and deletes are slow. A um, couple of uh, tweaky things. Watch your compila compilation model. You have to understand 64-bit, 32-bit, what you're deploying, especially if you're using native assemblies. C++ code, how is it assembled, how are you deploying it, what, what App, what model is that code running in? Worker roles are almost exclusively 64-bit. If you want to run a 32-bit compiled data library, you have to do some magic around it. Possibly you can do some magic. Um, this last point is important. How many, how many people know what Service Point Manager is and what the connection is? Connection limit is. Okay, so by default, if you're writing .NET code and you're interacting with a given URL, so the same URL, .NET out of the box will limit you to two active connections to that URL. So if your code is doing is trying to do a lot against the storage, Azure storage, which is for all intents and purposes the same root URL, you'll be limited, you'll be gated to two active at the same time. It's an easy change. You look at the docs, it's just an easy change in your code, you can actually set it to whatever value you want. But by default, you'll be limited to two. So we have these really slow, connect, slow interactions doing HTTP gets or puts against that URL unless you specifically change it. So that's a that's a small but big thing. To keep Does Azure allow you to change that within their system? Well, it's it's in your code, so you can so right within your code, you, as soon as you get into your thing, you can say service connection manager connection limit equals sixty four or whatever you want to do it. So yeah, you can set it to whatever value you want. Um, some other lessons is basically to use instrumentation, monitor your code. Unlike, unlike a server that you're hosting locally, this is something you can't see. You can't, you can't log at the end of the console and say, you know, start run perf non, enter to see what's happening. Right? So if you want to know what's going on, you have to use their APIs and you have to pull that stuff down. Pull it, schedule it up, set it up. This was a, you know, I had an app that was doing this, but I had no idea it was doing this until, until I went back and actually implemented the API and called the data that. So it's important. In, in my case, this was, this was good. I was trying to use my CPU as much as I could. This was bad, right? Because I'm paying, I'm paying for, for compute time that I'm not using in my case. Um, again, this was a similar case. This all looks pretty good. I'm using. I'm, these are a whole bunch of different node instances. I'm using them roughly where I am at the same level, but I am not even hitting 60%. So in scientific compute, 100% utilization is a good thing. Generally in web apps, we don't think that because that represents, quite often we represent something being overloaded or something, but scientific apps, you want to use as much CPU as you can because you're paying every cycle. So here, this is an opt this is an opportunity for optimization. Why am I only using 55 some odd percent of my CPU? Why can't I? What can I do to that algorithm and use that more? I went to uh, check in, and they talked about that. They said if you don't use 60 percent, you ought not to be uh, out there. Quite possibly. Again, because you're paying for every, every you're paying for for your cycles, right? Right. So it's it's a it's an economic scheme. Yeah, that's why you're talking about buying the bill of the super. Small shipping Yes. <clears throat> again, so this is just another example of monitoring importance. So this is again monitoring your collection data, instrumentation data, and we timed a handful of different operations. This, the next couple of slides are going to show you different timings from operations. And what I want you to think about while we're looking at it is not so much what the actual time values are, because those are important relative to my app, but probably not yours. What I want you to, to notice is the variance in some of the things. Some of them, 
because you're interacting with a with a with a TCP IP based network, you're doing HTTP protocols and things. There will be network traffic that slows you down. There will be oddnesses on the network. You you you're not on a dedicated network anymore. It's shared. So there's some interesting things that can come up. Um, this one is interesting. You know, our traffic is pretty tightly bunched, which is really good. But I've got some way out high anomalies in here, right? So your code, if you're if you're doing something that's time sensitive, you have to keep in mind. You know, I may have some things that are much slower. How am I going to handle? How am I going to handle this? How is my code going to respond if if something takes two or three orders of magnitude longer than normal to be to return, even just from the interaction? So this is just queue insertion. So all I was doing was just inserting into the standard Azure queue. Most of them are pretty consistent, but there is some pretty significant variance. Um, table inserts again. Fairly tightly, we did have some anomalies, and there are significant differences. But fairly tightly, packed in general. Um, again, this is this is pulling down from Azure storage to a Azure compute unit. Again, variances are important. And this is an interesting. You know, you, this sort of begs you to go back in and say, okay, now what happened at this instance in time? What what was going on on the network or in my code? This is what we just looked at. So this is one of the magic things we came up with. It's, it's amazingly simple to think about. Um, so if you want to focus on speeding up your transfers from to and from Azure Blob Storage, parallel, parallelize your app access. Okay. So how many people have done a lot with Azure Storage? Any with Azure Storage? Okay. So Azure. This is one of, the, one of the areas in which Amazon and Azure differ. So they sort of have the same storage paradigm, but Amazon is very much sort of the tr traditional file storage thing. You open, up, you open up a pipe, you send all of your bytes down there, you close it, it saves your file, right? End of story. They've got some limits, like you can't need more than five gigs or something like that, but that's, that's how it works. You give a name, a file name, or a key, and then you're done. Azure can work identically to that up to 64 megs. If, you're over six, if your file size is over 64 megs, they require you to block it. So you send it up in blocks. And they, you have a block size of no more than 4 megs per block. Okay? When I initially started doing this, I was like, that seems really inconvenient. It seems this extra half that I have to do. They built it into the library so you can really consume it and you didn't have to think about it. But you, that's how it's doing it under one. What's interesting, though, is if you want to, to, you can dramatically increase your throughput if you sort of embrace that blocking mechanism, and you always block your code and you parallelize the send of those blocks. And this shows you sort of an approach. Um, we take a source file, we split it into blocks, we calculate an MD5 for each. Using the task, task parallel library, we submit them all. Simultaneously, we just say, we just say, hey, for each or for IN, go do and do it parallelized. At the server side in Azure, they're going to validate the MD5 at each block level. They're going to store it, and then you do a, basically what's called a put block, a put block list operation, which says, here's all the blocks I think I sent you. This is where I want you to commit them in, and it stored, it stamps them and it serves it up as a single URL. Right? We saw some massive performance improvements. I'll show you a chart in a minute. Um, we did, frankly, we did the same thing with Amazon, but rather than being able to write and get directly against the storage platform like we did here, we inserted a data proxy, which we implemented as a WCF service running on a VC2 instance, that mimicked that same functionality. So we could get we could get the speed from us to them very quickly, and then did our sort of made it less optimal within their data center where their data where their network's going to be faster and they're not going to have the variance in public internet. But you can use some, and this works both both up and down, and even within the, within the Azure data center, you can get some really significant improvements. Um, and this gives you a, an idea of performance. So this is an improvement in transfer rate due to multi-threaded concurrent uploads. The colors represent different um, different block sizes. How big we made our blocks, what block size we're doing, and as we move this way, these are different file sizes. So we actually tested below 1 meg, so we start with 2K, 64K, etc. 
Below that spot, your overhead makes it inefficient, so it's not worth doing. At about 1 meg and up, we saw some significant improvements. Um, to put into context, this line is 500% improvement over, over this, which is 0% improvement. So if you can't see the scale. So we peaked out here, this is just around 3,000% improvement in our, in our transfer rate speeds. So we saw some it, significant. So order of, with, before we did this, transferring a gig file would take around 47 minutes. After this, it took three, which is significant. So it's, it's really simple, particularly with .NET 4 in the task parallel library. You don't, you don't have to think about a lot of magic. You simply do it and say, for each do. Let the system handle how many concurrent threads to do to upload and it works great. But this, again, will break both for up and down. The maximum, help, help maximize your throughput. ODA service we built, nothing magic here. Anybody playing with ODA? ODA browser. Here's some things to, as we're wrapping up, here's some things to look into. Um, my blog has, which is there, has source code, has source code for the task parallel library extension thing that I just mentioned. Um, actually, it I've implemented it as a as an extension method to the Microsoft Shipping Library, so you don't have to touch their code library, you just add this into your project, and you get an extra method that basically says upload as parallel, and magic happens for you. So the, all, you can use the, both the compiled version and the source codes available so you can look and see what we're doing. Um, a couple of things, other things to look at, Azure Scope, this is a tool put out by the Extreme Computing Group, or a collection, or it's basically a site put out by the Extreme Computing Group and Microsoft Research. They are, focused, they are tasked from a, from a vendor specific standpoint very much with the same type of work that I'm tasked with. So they're, they're focused on taking their platform and making it interesting, doing what they can to make it interesting to technical and scientific computing. But they have a lot of code samples, they have uh, performance, tip, performance optimization tips, they have sample code, benchmarks that they run, things that you can see. So if you're wanting to get an idea, or profiles of ideas, how your app may or may not run based on your usage profile. There's some great tools there. If you're wanting to do Monte Carlo simulation, or you're wanting to see sort of um, code samples that demonstrate this, you know, if, if you follow this space much, you'll hear people talk about extending the desktop into the cloud. And there are a couple of apps that do that. This Monte Carlo simulation shows you how they took it. Um, Visual Studio built an add-in for Excel that sort of behind the scenes transparently submits calculations or front end calculations into Azure and comes back. So the end user, all they know is they've got a spreadsheet that they put some values in and calculate in the back end there's all of these calls back and forth against Azure. Sort of interesting. No data feed browser is there. But that's it. Any questions, topics? On, on the parallel side, to what extent is it how quickly does it become client Where if I'm trying to write, you know, um, an e-commerce application and I've got my image storage and that type of thing, and so I've got a very average consumer out there with an average desktop um, and that type of thing, to what extent does their bandwidth into their home um, limit what's going on here? So, is it worth it? In other words, if I one of the big things that happens in a lot of websites is how fast can I get that image across the wire yes. onto their onto their box? If I go to the trouble like I'm using Silverlight, and so I've got a client connect to uh, um, an Azure App Fabric service that you know that's pulling, or or maybe it's just uh, uh, Silverlight hitting directly with the, trying to hit the Azure table to pull down images. TPL will help you. Okay. TPL will definitely help you there. Also, um, that's also a big scenario to pay attention to your service connection manager limit. Because again, your browsers will limit you to two consecutive threads by default. So if you, you want to step that up and say, 
Step up basically gives many to a reasonable number. You may not get all of those, but you'll get more than two. Right. Essentially, what you're saying is, I want if, if you've got if if your connection is this big, I want to I want to fill it, whatever that is. I want to pull as much as I can through as fast as I want to deliver you the best experience I can. So you, 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 your mileage will vary, right? So if right. you're at, at, at Oak Ridge, you've got you've got 100 gig E coming in the lab, right? right. <laughs> We have, we have a speed that most people won't, but even at that, I want to fill it as much as I possibly can. At the home level, at the consumer level, we want to fill it as much as we can. And you're not going to fill it with two, with just two. So an average home user that maybe has DSL access, mm -hmm. the networking configurations, you're still not... You're still not saturating yourself. You're, still, you're, not, you're not saturating your network connection yet. Yeah. Totally. Anything else? Well, thanks for coming.